This video is covering practical pointers, some important details on the Unit 3 practicals. Now, this is part one of two videos because there's quite a few practicals in Unit 3 that are quite long. And this is all part of Leaving Cert Biology revision. And we always have to keep in our mind that section B, that section based on the practicals, is worth 15% and you want 15%. So you must revise all of the experiments. Don't leave any out. And you're going to aim to complete all of section B, every single question on the day, to give yourself the best chance. The practicals are easy to revise. You've lots of time. You could actually do it in an afternoon. But a note of warning that these practical pointers, these videos are summaries only, a basic summary. I'm picking details just to prompt you to help you fill in some exam questions. So watch the other videos, know the practicals in detail and revise using your textbook. Really important because you might see lots of other little details there too. So the first practical in Unit 3 is to investigate the growth of leaf yeast using agar plates and controls. The leaves we use for this practical are the ash tree leaves and we collect them in a very particular way. We collect them in a plastic box on the morning of the practical and generally it has to be fine weather as well. The reason for the plastic box is so that you don't damage the leaves and the reason for the dry weather is rain can wash off the leaf use. It's very important as well that you collect the leaves from the lower branches and ideally in September. These lower leaves have been around for a longer time and so the chances of finding many colonies of yeast on them is greater. Anything to do with microbiology and you have to apply aseptic technique. This means using all precautions to ensure that your plates are free of contamination by other microorganisms. And in this experiment, you only want leaf yeast to grow. So firstly, all desks are cleaned with disinfectant. This is standard. We handled our leaves with a metal forceps and so anytime we touched the leaves or inside the Petri dish, we made sure that the forceps had been flamed and cooled. Flaming is a way of sterilising implements. There will be no microorganisms living, nothing living on that implement. What details crop up a lot? Well, what was the agar used? It was malt agar. The malt is the nutrient. It's the food added to the agar for those leaf yeasts. Agar is a gel. It's a growth medium. It's a growth surface for the leaf yeasts. And it was sterile to ensure there was no contamination. So we used sterile plates. The control in this practical was a sterile, unopened malt agar petri dish. There was no leaves in this dish. A key feature of this practical is that the leaves are stuck to the lid of the Petri dish and you can either use sections of leaves that are cut with a flame scissors or small whole leaves. That's what we generally use. And the leaves or the sections of the leaves are stuck to the lid with petroleum jelly. For example, Vaseline is one brand. And the trick to this is that you have to be very quick, so work speedily. You don't open the dish fully and you always use flame forceps to attach the leaf to the top of the dish and close it and seal it immediately. Immediately. You have to make sure that the underneath of the leaf, the undersurface, projects down or is looking down onto the malt agar. The fungus will discharge its spores forcibly onto the malt agar, so they'll just fall down directly underneath the leaf onto the malt agar. So for this reason, it's known as a mirror yeast. And the leaves must be attached with the top surface to the lid so this can happen. The control and the test plate are placed into the incubator set at 20 degrees Celsius. So in the first 24 hours, those fungal spores have landed onto the malt agar. But after 24 hours, you must turn the plate upside down. Otherwise, condensation will destroy those leaf yeasts. You're going to incubate for three days and then at the end of three days, examine your plates. Your test plate will have pink colonies, distinctively pink colonies of leaf yeast. Your control plate will have no growth at all. If there are many colonies of pink leaf yeast, when you compare them with your colleagues in the lab, it indicates that the leaves grew in an area of good air quality. There was a lack of pollution. You're often asked, how do you dispose of the plates? Well, they're immersed in disinfectant for 24 hours. And after this, then they're just placed in your normal dustbin. So they're disposed of in the bin. Next experiment is to do with the dicot stem. To prepare and examine microscopically a transverse section of a dicot stem and note that diagram, very important. You can use lots of different samples, but geranium or buttercup are two herbaceous plants that are easy to cut and often referred to. And I'm going to talk about the geranium because it features in the longer, more detailed video. Because you use a backed blade, these can be particularly dangerous. Make sure you can outline your safety features and precautions. So when you've got your geranium plant, you cut the section of the stem at an internode. This diagram is very important. It could come up elsewhere on your exams this year. So there's the geranium and you're going to take a section of the stem cut at the internode. 
Using a backed blade, you cut wafer thin sections from your stem. And the reason why you want your stem wet is because a wet herbaceous stem is turgid and so it's easier to cut. And the samples must be very thin because you want the light to go through them from the light microscope. You're going to transfer each of those little sections to a clock glass filled with distilled water. You can do that carefully using a forceps or a paintbrush, but we always use the forceps. So one of those sections is transferred to a glass slide and a drop of water is placed over it. A cover slip is applied at an angle and then you view that specimen or that sample under low power and then high power with your light microscope. And it's often really easy to get good photographs with your mobile phone down through the microscope and you use that to create your sketches. So in this particular practical, your sketch is very important because you have to identify those tissues, those plant tissues. So you should be able to identify dermal, ground tissue and then vascular tissue, those vascular bundles. And the reason why you know that this is a dicot stem is because the fixed arrangement of those vascular bundles around the edge. Because you remember that monocots are messy, there's no fixed arrangement of those vascular bundles. So next up it's the heart dissection. So you can either use an ox's heart or a sheep's heart and please bear in mind that it's very difficult to source hearts with the vessels attached or intact so excuse the pictures. So this is very straightforward. You're basically giving a tour of the heart, identifying all of the structures that you would be asked to identify if you had to draw the heart. So firstly, identify the front surface. That's called the ventral surface. It's more rounded than the back, which is the dorsal surface. And you can see the coronary artery grooves visible on the front of the heart. When you squeeze the heart, the left side of the heart, the left ventricle wall is thicker when squeezed. And you're going to use a scalpel to do those or to make those incisions. So you're going to make two incisions or you made two incisions from the left atrium down to the left ventricle and from the right atrium down to the right ventricle. And bear in mind, there's lots of ways of dissecting the heart. So here's the first incision we made and the second incision. So the first incision led us into the left side of the heart and we noted immediately how thick the wall of the left ventricle was, really thick. And then we noted the thin wall and the size of the left atrium, tiny in comparison. So when you were looking at the left ventricle, you noted the papillary muscles and the attached chordae tendineae, which led up and were attached onto the two flaps or the cusps of the bicuspid valve. And you could lift up each of those two flaps with a guide or with a forceps. So the next part of the practical involved making another incision. So this time we made an incision up through the aorta. The reason for that was to visualise the semilunar valve. It has three flaps or cusps. Number one. There's number two and there's the final or the third cusp. Just above the semilunar valves, there are two holes. You can just see one here. It's the origin of a coronary artery, but there is another one for the other coronary artery. They're at the base of the aorta above the semilunar valve. You also made note of the septum, the wall separating the left and right sides, and now the incision to the right side of the heart. We noted the very thin wall of the right ventricle in comparison to that of the left ventricle, it was noticeably much thinner. We also noted those chordae tendineae and it was straightforward to visualise and to feel with the forceps each of those three flaps of the tricuspid valve. So the final incision was up through the pulmonary artery and the reason for that incision was to visualise or to expose the three flaps of the semilunar valve and that was very straightforward. So remember, don't get head up about this. People often don't like this practical. Just give an account in steps of the incisions made, the key features you saw, exposing the semilunar valves and the thickness of the walls and you'll gain plenty of marks. Next practical is to investigate the effect of exercise on the pulse of a human. And this is one practical where technology trumps. So it's more accurate to measure pulse rate with a pulse monitor. Most smart watches or sports watches specifically will have pulse monitors built in where they monitor and give you a reading for your beats per minute. So your pulse rate is also known as your heart rate and it's measured in beats per minute. So your BPM. You begin the experiment by determining your resting pulse rate or your resting BPM. Sit down for five minutes and take a reading after five minutes. Make sure that it's stable and unchanged. This is your control. Stand and immediately take a reading. Let it return to resting rate. Then you're going to walk for five minutes. Immediately take a reading. Let it return to resting rate. So then you're going to walk more briskly for five minutes. Immediately take a reading and let it return to resting BPM.
And finally, you're going to run for five minutes and immediately take a reading after those five minutes. Each time the reading must be taken immediately or it won't be accurate. You may have compared the results with your classmates, but you should have plotted the results on a bar chart. So pulse rate increases, the BPM increases with increasing activity because the heart has to pump faster. Athletes will have a lower resting heart rate because their heart is stronger. They'll also recover faster. Age, illness and medications impact heart rate. We have just reviewed the first few practicals in Unit 3, so be mindful that this is a summary video, just pointers. Please read your textbooks, look at the other videos if they help, do pass papers and consult your teacher's notes. Unit 3 practicals part 2 will follow. Best of luck.